Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the Lord, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. To make a right beginning of repentance and as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now kneel as we are able before our God. Holy God, our lives are laid open before you. Rescue us from the chaos of sin, and through the death of your Son, bring us healing and make us whole in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated for the proclamation of the word? A reading from the prophet Joel. Sound the trumpet in Jerusalem. Raise the alarm on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble in fear because the, Lord, the day of the Lord is upon us. It is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick clouds and deep blackness. Suddenly, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a great and mighty army appears. Nothing like it has been seen before or will ever be seen again. That is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. Who knows, perhaps he will give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of this curse. Perhaps you will be able to offer grain and wine to the Lord your God as before. <clears throat> Blow the ram's horn in Jerusalem. Announce a time of fasting. Call the people together for a solemn meeting. Gather all the people, the elders, the children, and even the babies. Call the bridegroom from his quarters and the bride from her private room. Let the priests who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and the altar. <clears throat> let them pray, spare your people, Lord. Don't let your special possession become an object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners who say, has the God of Israel left them? Hear what the Spirit is saying. The psalm for today is Psalm 51. It's found in your bulletin. We're going to read the psalm responsively by the half verse. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Wash me through and through from my wickedness. For I know my transgressions. Against you only have I sinned. 
And so you are justified when you speak. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth. For behold, you look for truth deep within me. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Make me hear of your joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again. And sustain me with your God and spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked. And sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God. Open my lips, O Lord. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice. Glory to God, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. <clears throat> we speak for Christ when he we plead, come back to God, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it, for God said, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us, and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are ignored, even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We owe nothing, and yet we have everything. Hear what the Spirit is saying.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites the blooming trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward that you ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then, your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. For then try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. That's the only reward that you ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, and wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting, except your Father who knows what you do in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you. Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moods eat then and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in the steel. Store your treasures in heaven, where moods and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in the steel. Whatever your treasure is, there's the desire of your heart will also be. The Gospel of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? In his spiritual masterpiece, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis describes the correspondence between a senior demon who is much lower in the lowerarchy of hell than a junior tempter who's been assigned to his very first human soul to see that he can usher that human soul uh, down to hell 
rather than up to heaven. And by using this device of the letters between these two demonic characters, C.S. Lewis exposes to us many of the foibles of being human. And also, he lays bare, he reveals some of the more subtle works of the devil as far as convincing us in ways we believe. He lists off at various points, um, you know, excellent work by the tempters further down in the lower archy as things like fashion and politics. These are things that they, hell itself invented in order to pervert human beings in the wrong direction. But in the midst of it all, he does some really powerful speaking about virtues and vices. And this is not something you hear much in the church anymore, virtues and vices. The idea that there are virtues which you should uh, cultivate and bring close to your heart, things that are meant to grow you spiritually and bring you closer to the Lord, and vices which, by their very nature, pull you away from God and focus you not uh, outward toward fellow human beings, but inward toward yourself. And in a series of complicated and elaborately grammatically correct paragraphs, Screwtape and Wormwood discuss this, and I'm going to make a hash up of it, so forgive me. But he points out that the project of modernity, for most of you that's where you live, or post-modernity, where people slightly younger than us live, they have managed to invert virtue and vice. The whole point, uh, this is getting, I'm getting feedback now, so you should just be aware of that. It's starting to sound like I'm in a soup can. <laughs> Screw tape is pointing out that uh, the, the real method is to get human beings, instead of what Paul is saying in his epistles, rather than pushing vice away from the center of your being, he wants us to pull vice in closely and rather than live with virtue close in our hearts, they want to invert it and send it far away. So pull vice in and push virtue out is the exact opposite of what we're supposed to do as spiritually aware people. And screw tape says the way to do this is to take the closest possible vice to its matching virtue and flip them, right? So selflessness as a virtue gets flipped and becomes selfishness. But you don't call it that. What you do is you call it, um, well, I'm probably going to get into trouble here with certain, but, you know, mindfulness and self-care, right? The idea, I'm not talking about genuine care for yourself, but care for yourself to the exclusion of all other human beings, right? all about me and to hell with everyone else. There are all kinds of versions of this. It means taking genuine selfless love and inverting it into getting whatever you can out of the relationship, as opposed to the selflessness that is required to make a relationship work forever. And the mutuality of that relationship is inverted and turned into a kind of self obsessed reality about what I'm getting out of the relationship. Now, pace, all the things that go on in various relationships, these are not condemnations. These are just broad stroke comments about how human beings are brought to their destruction. And I want to point out one way in which we, as good, suburban, mostly uh, settler-type folk, have taken on the idea of sin. You may have noticed that we don't lament our sins very much. In fact, if you have ever, uh, well, first of all, if you wear a clerical collar for a living and you have ever traveled on a plane or a train, you know the story I'm about to tell you, right? You take your seat and you sit down and you pull out your magazine or your tablet or whatever it is that you're gonna pass the time with and the person next to you says, well, I don't go to church, but..." I'm a good person. And I'm, 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 I'm at that point in my life where I'm the grumpy old, get off my grass. You know, it's a, 
It's like, I just want to eat my airline meal in peace, and, and uh, no, but, uh, but I'm a good person. Oh, that, that's nice. And then, then they proceed to tell me all about the reasons they don't go to church, and um, they tell me about the fact that they don't believe in God. And if I haven't gone completely grumpy or put on my noise-canceling headphones as an effort toward peace, uh, my own, not theirs, um, I will often ask them, tell me about the God you don't believe in. And they will begin to regale me with stories of, oh, mostly, I, I'm a historian, so the ahistoricity and the, the lack of fact in their sort of rambling indictment of Christianity or the church or, you know, God's resume, if you want to think of it that way, is pretty awful. But often at the end of their recitation, they say, well, that's good because I don't believe in that God either. It's not, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Because most folks were arrested in their development, their faith development, at about age 12 or the end of confirmation class. A number of which accomplished their confirmation class in order to please grandma or mom and dad. The church has never been good with our catechesis. Because sometimes in our desire to impart to people the profound love and transfiguration and transformation we have all found in the gospel, we wouldn't be here otherwise, I hope, sometimes the average 12-year-old in the confirmation class has the attention span of, you know, St. Peter. <laughs> dumb, as a dumb as a bucket of hair. They're just, they're not, you know, go read, the, go read the Gospels about how Jesus dealt with the apostles. There are times, depending on the translation of the Scripture, you're pretty sure Jesus is calling them all dolts. <laughs> Even Paul loses his patience with the Galatians. You remember how he starts the very, uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You stupid Galatians. We, we as a people have forgotten how to discipline ourselves in virtues and vices. And, and instead of understanding how to lament our own sins, because if you are tempted to say to someone who dresses like me when they sit down next to you on a plane or a train that I'm a good person, um, Maybe you've missed the point. So here's the thing. What we have learned to do, and this is almost like C.S. Lewis, right? We don't often lament our own sins anymore. We lament other people's sins. In a world where we're all basically good people, we don't have that much to confess, right? You know, I was a little short-tempered and I didn't get my things done or whatever. We, we don't think about our own actions in terms of the category of sin or sins that we enjoy just by watching the evening news. And in losing track of our ability to lament our own sins and only lament other people's sins, we actually disconnect ourselves from other human beings. So we have taken the virtue of lament and inverted it from its intended virtue of lamenting our own sins before God and therefore accessing that mercy which he desires above all else to pour out on us. We've inverted that into lamenting other people's sins who simply cannot get it right and if they would just behave properly, this is the Anglican way, if they would just behave properly, the world would be fine. So, what I'm saying to you today, on Ash Wednesday, is we need to recover the lament of our own sins. I, <clears throat> I am of that generation, I'm the kind of the, I, I took on Facebook in 2005 as a university chaplain, it was a brilliant way to communicate with students, and I've never really left. But the problem is, my brain is polluted with what everyone's opinion about these things are as I scroll through. And the other night, I, I read a post by someone I respect deeply, which I thought was so far off the mark, I had to read it again just to be sure they hadn't gone completely stark raving mad. They were opining that the problem with Ash Wednesday is that we already feel bad enough about ourselves and that we, 
really need to take on self-care and imagine that, you know, that God loves us as we are. Absolutely. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God loves us as we are, but he loves us enough to not leave us there. I'm going to say that again. God loves us and desires for us peace, glory, and his love in eternity. And he loves us exactly as we are. But I have bad news for you. He doesn't want to leave you where you are. How many of us, if we really honestly examine our consciences before the Lord, would say, I'm exactly who you made me to be. I have got it right. The arrow is in the middle of the bullseye. And if you can't say that, and I'm t here to tell you, you should not say that, then you need to learn to lament your own sin. Not beat yourself up for them. But it is in, see, the purpose of lamenting other people's sins is for other people to know their sins in our twisted logic, right? If we tut, tut, tut about what so-and-so is doing and think what a shame it is and what will their mother think and what about the children? Won't somebody please think about the children? There's a quote from The Simpsons for you, those of you who remember such things. If you are lamenting other people's sins, you're hoping that those other people will come to repentance. But here's the catch. What about those people who are lamenting your sin? How's that working for you? Has that brought you to any level of conversion in your life? Because if you're lamenting other people's sins, then the whole purpose would be for other people to lament yours. How's it going? Well, of course, it doesn't work that way, does it? We are called, as Christians, to bow before God and acknowledge that we have not been who we are meant to be. And in doing so, hear from the Lord that wonderful, wonderful phrase, come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Ash Wednesday is not an orgy of guilt. It is not a shame spiral that you need to dwell in. It is actually, in its weird, backward, Christian way, a day of celebration. When I misbehaved as a kid, I didn't grovel on the floor in front of my father to ask forgiveness. I stood before him and was disciplined. He told me in, he was a naval officer, so you can imagine he told me in language clear, explicit, and blisteringly, uh, well, transparent, where I had transgressed, what I needed to do to remedy the transgression, and the third part of the equation was always the same, how much he loved me. And it's the same transaction here today. We are meant to pour out before God the ways in which we have not lived up to his commandments, confess them, acknowledge that we will do our best to amend our lives, and then turn around, oh, and before you go, I love you with all my heart. I cannot help but love you. You were born to be loved by me, and so my forgiveness is yours in abundance equal to that of the depths of the ocean. That's not a shame spiral. Nor is it an orgy of guilt. It's actually a good, old-fashioned way of confession and absolution. If you're going to admit your sins before God and think that that somehow is going to put you into a shame spiral, then I don't think you know the God you're confessing to. I think you might have a vision of a God that is hanging over the balconies of heaven, throwing lightning bolts at people who might be having fun and ought to stop it. Or a God who's out to get you, who has set up a universe that is hostile to you. Today, Ash Wednesday for Christians, is a testimony to the fact that the universe is set up not as your enemy, but as a blessed playground in which you are meant to grow and love God. And so we can confess all our corporate sins, all our sins against nature and sins against the earth and sins against one another, 
But none of those confessions really matter unless we get to the most important one. And that's our own sin. So, time to talk about those virtues and vices and make sure that the virtues you are pulling close are the real thing. And the vices that you push away during Lent are the real thing. And don't worry about lamenting other people's sins because that doesn't work for them any better than the fact that they've been lamenting about yours. Instead, in the immortal words of one of my little friends, uh, sons of one of my friends, he says, I'm going to put on my big boy pants today and I'm going to stand up and I'm going to, I'm going to do the thing. That's what we're talking about here. We're all going to put on our big boy or big girl pants and we're going to stand before God and we're going to say, we're not living up to the standard you'd set. And we are sorry. And we ask you to give us the grace and help we need to make it right. And then we have to wait and listen for those words whispered in the back of our hearts and minds. Oh, how I love you. I can't help but love you. And how I forgive you. Amen. Let us now call to mind our sin and the infinite mercy of God. God the Father, have mercy upon us. God the Son, have mercy upon us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy upon us. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, have mercy upon us. From all evil and mischief, from pride, vanity, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all evil intent, good Lord, Lord deliver, deliver us. From sloth, worldliness, and love of money, from hardness of heart and contempt for your word and your laws, good Lord, Lord deliver, deliver us. From sins of the body and mind, from the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, good Lord, Lord deliver us. In all times of sorrow, in all times of joy, in the hour of death, and at the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your birth, childhood, and obedience, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, good Lord, deliver us. By your ministry in word and work, by your mighty acts of power, and by your preaching of the kingdom, good Lord, deliver us. By your agony and trial, by your cross and passion, and by your precious death and burial, good Lord, deliver us. By your mighty resurrection, by your glorious ascension, and by your sending of the Holy Spirit, good Lord, deliver us. Give us true repentance. Forgive us our sins of negligence and ignorance and our deliberate sins. And grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your holy word. Holy God, Holy and Mahan, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. Make our hearts clean, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you bless, hallow, and sanctify these ashes as they are imposed. Make them a warning and a comfort to us, though your infinite grace is forever. Our mortal bodies are not. Amen.
Dear friends in Christ, I invite you to receive these ashes as a sign of the spirit of penitence with which we shall keep this season of Lent. God our Father, you create us from the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be for us a sign of our persistence and a symbol of our mortality. For it is by your grace alone that we receive eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, of mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. You impose on me first. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen. Remember your dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember your dust, and to dust you shall return. Once the choir has received their Remember your imposition dust, of ashes, we invite return. you to come down the center aisle Remember in a single dust, line, and, dust you shall and the return. bishop will impose ashes on those who would like to receive Remember them as a sign dust, dust of your you Lenten journey. Amen. Remember your dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt Amen. return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust shall, thou shalt return. Remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that thou shalt art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Remember that
As you're able, would you please stand? The mystery of love is this, not that we have loved God, but that God has first loved us and has sent us the remedy for the defilement of our sins, his son. As God has loved us so much, so ought we to love one another and share with one another a sign of that love in the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's greet one another in the name of the Lord. Before we carry on with the offertory hymn, just a couple of quick uh, 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 words. First, uh, sit down for a moment. Yeah, that's probably easier. The first thing I want to just say is what a delight it is to have our Bishop William with us here today for our Ash Wednesday service, but also uh, to guide us into our Lenten journey at this uh, first day of Lent. And it's just such a pleasure to have him with us and uh, as he begins his ministry uh, in this par parish of his, but also in the diocese. And uh, so it's great to have him here with us in worship today. Uh, I want to just say a word about communion. Uh, as communion is uh, given, uh, the regular bread and wine will be distributed here at the steps in our usual fashion. For those of you who are gluten-free, a separate area will be over here to the right uh, by the Lady Chapel and uh, the gluten-free uh, communion will be given out there separately from the rest. So welcome to all of you. It's so nice to see uh, members from other congregations here sharing with us today, and, and what a delight it is to have us all together to begin our journey. Our offertory hymn is 40 Days and 40 Nights.
Merciful God, turn us from sin to faithfulness, accept our offering and prepare us to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is alive and reigns with you now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. Because you bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that reborn through the waters of baptism and renewed in the Eucharistic mystery, we may be more fervent in prayer and more generous in the works of love. Therefore, we raise our voices to you in praise to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we, we remember his death, we, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new. 
and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins. We break this bread, communion in Christ's body, once broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If we have died with him, we shall live with him. If we hold firm, we shall reign with him.
Let us pray. God of compassion, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you reconciled your people to yourself. Following his example of prayer and fast, may we obey you with willing hearts and serve one another in holy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow him. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our concluding hymn, a beautiful hymn to end our service, number 564, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. Dear brothers and sisters, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. He is a sacrifice for our sins, that we might live through him. If God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us. Go in peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.